This is the image of an Apple store that the company wants you to see. Masses of customers hungry for the latest product. Knowledgeable young staffers eager to serve them. A mad rush to be among the first to buy a brilliant new device. Lately, however, that positive image is being tarnished by stories of customers being wildly overcharged for repairs in Apple stores. We decided to use a hidden camera to verify many reports that Apple customers are often told their malfunctioning computers are not worth fixing, even when minor repairs could remedy the problem. How are you? I have an appointment at 2.30. Come with me. Our team came to a Toronto Apple store with a MacBook computer that had a common problem. The screen had stopped working. It's like very dim when I try to turn it on. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll jump out the back and have a look on the inside. Sure. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of liquid that's gotten on the inside. Um, so I took a little picture. Um, the little red dots here, they're normally white, and it means that they've come in contact with liquid. So for it to be basically all over the whole computer, it means that it, um, something's gone through the whole thing. Um, so with that, we'd need to be looking at replacing quite a few components. Um, are you sure it's a, could it be something else as well? Well, regardless of what the cause of it is, if it isn't the liquid, we have to fix the liquid. So it's not uh, like we can't do partial repairs when it's been damaged by something. So what are my options now? Well, this, oh, well, what I was going to say is basically all the components that we need to replace is going to cost more than $1,000. So To fix it entirely will yeah. cost more than $1,000? Yeah. So it, the very least we'd need to replace is the logic board and the top case. So that we're looking at 600 plus 500, doing $1,100 with a labor of 100. And then if we need to replace the display as well, that's another 780. So the display we may not need to replace, but we're still looking at a total of around $1,200. Wow. So just to be clear, there's no cheaper alternative for this? Um, I mean, that, that cost is very close to the cost of buying a new computer. In terms of fixing it in the store, no. Many Apple customers have shared similar experiences, and so we decided to double check the diagnosis. On First Avenue in Manhattan, there is a small computer repair store run by Lewis Rossman. He started fixing computers in college and now makes YouTube videos teaching people how to repair complex items. Overall, Apple tries to get you to purchase a new device instead of repair your old one. His videos often draw millions of views. We brought him the computer that the Apple store in Toronto said was not worth fixing. Right, have a seat. So this is a MacBook Pro that uh, Apple, uh, the Apple store said would t it cost $1,200 to fix and wasn't worth doing. All right, let's take a look and see if that's true. See, see you can see the Apple logo there? Mm -hmm. yeah, and watch, if I take a light and I put it through there, you'll actually be able to see everything on the screen. So this is my microscope light. And when I put it right through here, you can see that there's a cursor there and that it's moving. So most right. of the screen is working properly. It's just that the, the backlight is not working. Right. This could be either due to a bad screen, a bad motherboard, bad cable. Uh, we'll figure that out once we open it up. Okay. All right, so let's take a look on the inside of this. Now, this is where the screen is going to connect to the computer. Okay. So the first thing I'd want to do is examine that area of it to see what it looks like. See the, see the pin that's sticking out? Okay. So that pin is actually most likely the pin for the backlight. Okay. And as you can see, it's probably not making contact because it's bent outwards. And I got my set of tweezers over here, and I'm just going to try to push that back into the slot and try to get it back into its groove so that when I re-plug in the connector, it'll work. Uh, at the Apple store, they suggested this was water damage. Well, you can see that there are water indicators that have turned red, so that's why they got that idea, and they're by the battery. So this, this is a water indicator, uh, and these, these turn red when they see liquid. However, the thing here is that these not only turn red when they see liquid, they also turn red anytime there's humidity. 
So if you have this in a very humid room, all of these sensors will turn even if you've never spilled liquid on the machine. All right, so let's plug this back in and hope for the best. All right, as you can see, we've got an apple and we have mm -hmm. a light. So it's it fixed. Yeah, now... Uh, that, that took you like one and a half minutes? Maybe. <laughs> So if I walked in off the street with this problem, what would you charge to, for the repair you just did? If somebody wanted me to just bend the pin back, I wouldn't charge them for that. I would say, I'm gonna rework your original cable. That may not last long term, but here, it's free. If they wanted us to replace the cable, depending on the model, anywhere from 75 to 150, depending on the difficulty of opening that model. But something like this, we wouldn't charge for. And 99% of the time, just bending the pin back, it'll allow it to last until the end of the life of the computer. We asked Apple to respond to this incident. It's going to cost more than $1,000. To fix it entirely will yeah. cost more than $1,000? Yeah. So and to the widespread the allegations place. of similar corporate behavior. They declined to provide a spokesman, but issued a statement claiming their customers are best served by Apple's certified experts using genuine parts. They denied systematically overestimating repair costs. How often do people show up here with uh, the Apple store telling them it can't be fixed or it's too expensive to fix? Somewhere between 10 and 30 times a day. No kidding. Yeah. In San Luis Obispo, California, iFixit is probably the most successful third-party repair business in North America. The business tests cell phones and computers, diagnoses problems that regularly occur, and develops the tools and techniques to repair them. They sell the tools and repair manuals over the internet. iFixit has 125 employees and makes $21 million a year. The business is owned by Kyle Weens, who is also a leading spokesman for the national right to repair movement. It used to be that you, if you bought something, you'd be able to get it fixed when you needed to. And over time, we've lost that ability, whether it's a vacuum or a television or a laptop. It's increasingly more challenging to get access to the information that you need, or for local shops to get the parts. So right to repair is a movement and a set of legislation that would restore that ability to fix your own stuff. How does Apple fit into that question? Apple's perspective is that they want complete control over the device from the moment that you buy it all the way through the end of life. And Right to Repair uh, takes some of that control away from them and puts it in the hands of the owner. And, and that's where, for, for a manufacturer to say, we're making a product and we're putting it out in the world and we're going to control every aspect of what happens after the fact is, is complete lunacy. We asked Kyle Weens to show us some of the tricks Apple uses to foil easy repairs starting with okay. non-standard screws. So this is the Pentalob screw. It's on the bottom of the MacBook uh, Pro, and it's, it's these little five points so you can see. It's, it's not like any screw that you've seen before. And it turns out that Apple invented their own screw. It's, it's purely, they want to uh, make the devices harder for normal people to open with the tools that they already have laying around. Mm -hmm. Then Apple started gluing in batteries. This is an iPhone 8, and, and this is the battery, and it's glued in, and that's unfortunate. It doesn't need to be glued in. Batteries didn't used to be glued in. Was it one of those kind of pull and release yeah, tabs? Yeah, it, it, 3M calls them command adhesive. Right. Okay. There, and it broke. Hmm. <laughs> and so, <laughs> hmm. oh, there's your home button. On some Apple phones, the home button would have to be replaced if the screen cracked. And I can take the home button now. It was a cheap and easy repair, but then Apple reprogrammed the operating system to detect non-authorized home buttons, and the phone would suddenly stop working. Yeah, it would be like if you're driving your car and maybe you changed out the tires and you had aftermarket tires, and then all of a sudden Tesla pushes out a software update and your car stops driving because of those aftermarket tires. It, it, this stems from a mentality that they're the center of the universe and nobody else is doing anything with their products. Apple insists that its products are best serviced by its own staff and clearly sees unauthorized third-party repair businesses as the enemy. Lewis Rossman and iFixit have received legal threats from the company when they publish schematics or repair manual information. I would be happy with a rollback on the intellectual property law and the uh, immigrations and customs enforcement law that allow people to be either thrown in jail or prosecuted for importing parts and for showing a schematic. 
because Apple writes the manual, they own the copyright to it. And so if you post that manual online, they'll send you a legal takedown threat saying that's our copyrighted material. If you don't take it down, we'll sue you for up to $150,000 in, in damages per incident. And, and those legal threats have, have really put a damper on repair information online. The tide may be turning against Apple on the right to repair issue. I just did a video of myself fixing a phone that drives they were supposed to fix. This is the New York State Legislature, where Lewis Rossman and the Right to Repair movement have set up a repair cafe to put on a show for politicians. Which one of these, one, two, and three, do you think is covering up the battery connection? Probably this one. Probably that one. So far this year, 17 U.S. states have introduced Right to Repair legislation that would force Apple and other companies to provide repair manuals and spare parts to third-party repair businesses. I'd like Apple to change by acknowledging that if they're not willing to do certain jobs, maybe somebody else would. And to just, I, I'm not even asking them to extend an olive branch. I'm just asking them to, you know, stop extending the knife. What happens when the first state actually passes one of these proposed legislation? Well, this is where it gets really interesting, is the moment that one state passes things, it's, it's, the dam is going to burst. So if Ontario decided we're going to pass right to repair legislation, that could actually pass right to repair for the world. Because manufacturers aren't going to provide products differently to people in, in one jurisdiction. They want to simplify their operations. The right to repair movement has put a spotlight on some of Apple's predatory business practices. I mean, that, that cost is very close to the cost of buying a new computer. And many Apple customers are starting to wonder whether the company really has their best interest at heart. Terrence McKenna's documentary continues after the break. When we come back, Apple customers accuse the company of a sneaky policy that pressured them to buy new smartphones. It was sort of a eureka moment, uh, and that's what prompted me to really take a deep dive into our uh, performance data and see what was happening. After an incident last winter, Apple faced a fresh allegation. Customers suspected the company had a policy designed to pressure them into buying new smartphones. Here's Terrence McKenna with part two of tonight's documentary. One night last December, at the office of a Toronto software firm called Primate Labs, founder John Poole was trying to solve a mystery. His company sells an application called Geekbench that millions of customers use to analyze the performance of their cell phones and computers. His customers were complaining that their Apple iPhones were suddenly running a lot slower, and they wanted to know why. My wife just offhand mentioned that her iPhone success felt slow, and the numbers that we got out of it were significantly lower than what I'd expect from a phone like that, uh, to the point where I didn't believe it was happening. Then he noticed an anonymous post on the internet telling people, if your iPhone's slow, replace the battery. It was sort of a eureka moment, uh, and that's what prompted me to really take a deep dive into our database of uh, performance data and see what was happening. Pool plotted the performance of millions of iPhones on a graph. The performance of many phones was cut down after the latest operating system upgrade from Apple. John Poole published his findings, which amounted to a scientific accusation that Apple headquarters in Cupertino, California, was intentionally slowing down customers' phones without telling them. To his surprise, the company quickly admitted it, but insisted they were doing nothing wrong. Well, meanwhile, we're awaiting a decision to see whether Apple will face a class action lawsuit. After it admitted to slowing down older iPhones. The tech giant says it's done to save battery life. Apple's admission that it was intentionally slowing down the performance of older iPhones triggered news reports around the world. Forum Reddit complained their iPhones were running slow. It looked like a case of planned obsolescence, an effort to pressure consumers into buying new products when they didn't have to. But Apple's CEO, Tim Cook, denied it. We always focus on the user experience. So at the heart of any decision that we make is the user. There has been an international upsurge in anger from Apple customers. At this demonstration in Paris, Apple is portrayed as the evil empire, accused of tax evasion and cheating customers. France has moved to make planned obsolescence a crime and has placed Apple under formal investigation. So my father was a 
the judge. On Apple's home turf in California, Canadian consumer rights lawyer Shanna Scarlett was previously part of a successful lawsuit that forced Apple to pay a $450 million fine for breaking U.S. antitrust laws. Now she has launched a class action lawsuit alleging that Apple has tricked its customers. They've actively reached in to a consumer's phone through the operating system and made what is a large change in terms of the throttling of performance without properly disclosing it to consumers. That is a, you know, a fairly uh, invasive act for a company to do. Apple declined our request for an interview. But when the government of Canada demanded an explanation from the company at a parliamentary committee hearing in March. And with us today we have from Apple Canada, uh, Jacqueline Famulac. Apple Canada lawyer Jacqueline Famulac agreed to appear. The sole purpose of the software update in this case was to help customers to continue to use older iPhones with aging batteries without shutdowns, not to drive them to buy newer devices. I think that if Apple were truly interested in the, uh, the consumer's interest, maybe it could have told them that the entire problem would have been solved by a battery replacement, that it wasn't necessary to face the stark choices of throttling performance, automatic shutdowns, or buying a new phone. There was a fourth option on the table. That was just replace the battery. I don't think that Apple did anything wrong. Mr. Erskine-Smith, you have five minutes. Apple's lawyer was challenged by Toronto Liberal MP Nathan Erskine-Smith, who pointed out that Apple had issued a sort of apology for its actions. Now, you've strangely today said Apple did nothing wrong, but the issue is disclosure, and Apple apologized for non-disclosure uh, in relation to the slowed performance. So, uh, was the non-disclosure uh, intentional or inadvertent? We did not non-disclose anything. We didn't have anything to not disclose. About the slowed performance of the phone, the very reason you're attending today, that you did not disclose to consumers, was that non-disclosure intentional or inadvertent? It was not intentional. Apple's admission that it did not properly disclose the slowdown is key to Shanna Scarlett's lawsuit against the company, a case that she says proves the value of consumer class actions. How are you, one person, supposed to fight against Apple? How is one person with $10 of harm supposed to fight against one of the most well-capitalized uh, companies in the entire world? It's impossible. Silicon Valley has been driving the U.S. economy for years now, but there is growing scrutiny on the questionable business practices of Apple and other star companies here, and a growing movement to make them more accountable to consumers. For The National, I'm Terence McKenna in Cupertino, California.